Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar on getting the most out of your corn silage. Tonight's webinar is co-hosted by Agriculture Agri-Food Canada and the Beef Cattle Research Council. I'm Stacey Domlewski, the Science and Extension Coordinator for the BCRC, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Our session tonight is going to last for approximately one hour, but it may go a little bit longer depending on the number of questions you have for us later during our question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, please tweet along with us tonight using hashtag beefwebinar. We are going to be recording this session and I will email out the link to the recording to everyone that's registered within the next couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight and want to watch it later, you can. Of course, for tonight's webinar, you'll be able to hear our presenters, but we can't hear you. So if you wanna communicate with us, please type into the small chat window on the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have questions or comments for me or either of the presenters, that's where you can put them. And feel free to send in those questions at any time throughout the presentation, but I'll ask them all at the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a little bit slow tonight, it might help to close any pro other programs that are using the internet, so any external servers you may be connected to. That means, um, so hopefully your slides will load a little bit faster that way and the audio will come through clearly. So let's get started. Here's what we're going to be covering tonight. And I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, or I guess both of our speakers for the night, Dr. Karen Boschman, who is a research scientist at Agriculture Agri-Food Canada. Before her career in research, Karen spent several years in the feed industry as a nutritionist. She conducts a broad-based research program to improve feed utilization of beef cattle when while reducing environmental impact of meat production. Um, we will also be hearing tonight from Dr. Vern Barron, who is a research scientist at Agriculture Agri-Food Canada as well. He was raised on a farm in southwestern Manitoba, and his research is in the areas of expanding the grazing season, environmental impact of beef production, and forage management on the environment. So I will turn it over to Karen here. Okay, so let me just uh, start from this risk management slide. Um, as I was saying, there's a lot of different interacting factors <coughs> that will affect yield and quality of corn silage. We have the plant hybrid genetics, the growing environment, the management factors, how you ensile, how you feed it out. You have some control over some of these factors, but not all, especially the environmental conditions, such as precipitation and temperature that are gonna fluctuate from year to year, causing yield and quality to vary. So in terms of minimizing risk, it's important to understand the impact of the factors and focus on the ones that you do have some control over. And this will help minimize the risk. And by risk, I mean, by uh, risk is having low yield or low quality silage that you have to deal with the entire year in terms of feeding your animals. So if you go to the next slide. Vern? It is on the next slide, Karen. Yeah, and Vern? Okay, so it's my turn now. This is Vern here, and um, Karen talked about uh, managing risk. And of course, the most obvious way that we manage risk is to learn how much it costs to grow our, our feedstuffs that we've got, no matter what they are. And um, um, by now, if you're interested in corn, you probably know or have heard that uh, corn is a relatively expensive crop to grow. If you're in an area where you're used to growing corn and you have a lot of corn heat units like Southern Ontario or Southern Manitoba, perhaps making these comparisons um, aren't so meaningful for you. But if you're in the central prairies, uh, if you're in um, central or Northern Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Alberta, uh, then you may have some experience in making barley silage and so you may be making a decision between using cereal silages or corn. We know that corn is higher quality, um, but um, you have to make up for a difference in the expense of growing it 
uh, with the yield of yield and concentration or nutrients derived from your investment. So the slide that you have in front of you is information that I've taken from Manitoba Agriculture Cost of Production Spreadsheets, and they do a very nice job of comparing costs um, uh, using a spreadsheet partial budget method um, for, for most things they do. So you can have access to it, and these costs are the 2018 um, uh, version of what they do. So... If we're trying to make a decision between using, um, say, barley silage or corn silage, <clears throat> the cost of production for uh, corn silage uh, operating cost is almost twice that of barley. Um, the two major differences in cost are the, the, the cost of the seed that you would use and the cost of fertilizer as well. Um, the seed cost uh, in this case is based on 32,000 plants per acre. I've uh, got my units in hectares, but it's 32,000 plants uh, per, per acre. The fertilizer that's used here is um, higher for corn than for barley. And in this case, it's 130 pounds of nitrogen versus 80 for barley. Uh, you would have 50, um, 50 pounds of phosphate for uh, corn and uh, 20 for barley and and in the partial budget from Manitoba they used uh, potassium and sulfur for corn and not for barley. The amount of fertilizer that you would use in any year has to be proportional to your target yield and the amount of available plant nutrients that the soil that you have would give up so it isn't always the same everywhere you are. When you hear people talk about corn, you hear amounts of well over 150 pounds of, of nitrogen are necessary, but that isn't the case um, depending on your situation of uh, available nutrients in your soil and uh, the possible yield that you might get. For example, even with the barley silage in this case, uh, we would expect higher yields of barley than they indicated in um, Manitoba and we'd probably be using about 100 pounds of nitrogen. But the target yields here are relatively modest and the target yields are uh, five imperial tons of dry matter per acre for the corn and about half that much for the barley. So we can move on to the next slide. So the first thing of uh, besides the cost is getting our agronomics right and the way we want to grow corn is highly dependent on the area that you come from or your geographical area uh, and we have a number of things that that we should add to our list of things to check you likely have some knowledgeable seed companies and experienced growers and consultants in your area and you have to be sure that you're up to date on um, the local conditions I'm going to start with a list of things, but I'll start with the number two first, and that is that short season corn that we grow uh, are much smaller than the, the corn plants that you would see in the, the Corn Belt or even southern Ontario. And um, corn has a relatively low leaf area index, which means that um, it intercepts a, a lower amount of uh, of uh, incident sunlight than we would have with other crops. So maybe you have uh, 2 to 2.5 leaf area index for corn. Well, uh, in the middle of summer in uh, Alberta, uh, about heading time with barley, you have six. The barley doesn't use the whole growing season and corn does. So we depend on, on uh, having a relatively high plant density for corn silage. Um, we can get responses up to 40,000 plants per acre. In the Manitoba case, they use 32. You have to weigh that. Uh, number that high plant density off against um, what your water holding capacity of your soil is. If you're in a drier region, you may go as low as 20,000 plants per acre. Also, one of the things that we'll start talking about is the effect of grain on, on the quality of the um, corn silage and um, that affects the starch content. So maybe looking at the optimum density for grain corn in your particular area will give you a good idea of what you should have for your plant density for silage. For example, if if you thought that you shouldn't go over 30,000 plants per acre for um, 
uh, for density for grain, maybe you should only go up to about 32,000 for silage. Row spacing is also something that people talk about, but row spacing isn't as important as plant density to increase your yield. Planting depth is important for uniformity of the stand, and it's more important than the uniformity of space within a row. Uh, the planting depth affects the, uh, the plant maturity and time of soaking and that sort of thing. And generally, uh, a, a lack of uniformity with depth would affect your grain yield, and then your grain yield would influence your um, uh, silage quality. Most important thing, though, is to choose corn hybrids that fit within the maturity zone of your area. And that's what we're going to talk about next. <clears throat> so the slide that you have in front of you here is a corn heat unit map for the, the, the Canadian prairies. Um, and um, corn heat unit zones or adaptation zones for growing corn are based on the long-term uh, weather data for uh, each, each area of, the, of uh, the respective provinces. And each province, no matter where you are, whether you're in Quebec or Ontario or the prairies, the Maritimes have a slightly different time of starting and stopping their corn heat unit accumulation, um, but um, they're the best we have uh, in terms of deciding uh, whether you can grow corn and uh, or whether, um, uh, some corn hybrids will fit within those zones or not. Corn hybrids themselves are rated uh, for corn heat units based on grain maturity. And um, it's a relative thing that the corn companies do. They rate their new corn hybrids versus what their, um, uh, what their, their prevalent corn hybrids are. Um, they work relatively well for areas of um, that are well known for corn production and may be less precise for areas of new corn production. Um, when I first started working with corn in the early 80s, we had only um, uh, small areas of, the we of Western Canada that were capable of growing grain corn and that would be around the Morden Carmen area in Manitoba and the Medicine Hat area in Alberta. At that time, we only had corn hybrids that were approximately 2,300 corn heat units. That was the earliest that we could get. And they weren't really very high quality corn hybrids compared to what we have now. Now we have an array of very high quality corn hybrids uh, in that corn heat unit rating area between 22,000 to 2,400 uh, corn, 2,200 to 2,400 uh, corn heat units. And we have corn hybrids that are as early as 2000. Generally speaking, the shorter the growing season we have and the newer the area of corn production, it's probably wise to choose corn hybrids that are fairly close to that, for silage that are fairly close to that rated, the rating for grain. And the areas where, uh, uh, that are warmer, like, uh, like Ontario or Southern Ontario, using corn hybrids that are rated perhaps 200 corn heat units greater uh, than that for the area for grain uh, may help you increase yield. So we can go to the next slide. In the next few slides, we'll talk about um, some of the relationships between maturity and corn heat units with um, a corn silage yield. And there are a number of ways of looking at this. We can look at uh, the amount of heat units that we would get from year to year within a location, particularly a short season location, which is what we would have in this slide. Or we can look at um, the um, impact of um, uh, different maturity hybrids within a location and then in corn maturity effects on yield and quality from cool places to warm places. What we find in the really uh, short season areas uh, where we don't know a whole lot about response of corn hybrids to uh, corn yield, it's not unusual um, because we have a lot of variation in corn heat units from year to year to have a lot of variation in, in yield from year to year. When we have that variation, 
in, in yield from year to year, that brings about an element of risk where sometimes we're yielding uh, below the economic thresholds that we want uh, and sometimes yielding well above them. And this data that we took over three years at Lacombe with a 2000 corn heat unit variety, our average corn heat units at Lacombe in the long term is 1850. And so in a year when we had uh, 1,650 corn heat units, our yield in that particular year on our, our uh, y-axis was less than 10 metric tons per hectare. And that would be a lower yield than we would get with barley silage. In another year, when we had 2,200 corn heat units, which happened to be the year after, uh, we exceeded uh, 15 uh, 15 uh, tons, metric tons per hectare. And so um, uh, the um, yields can fluctuate wildly uh, in the short season areas or anywhere, uh, but may yield more than expected. And even when we have um, corn heat units accumulating beyond what we would have rate our, our grain rating, our yields continue to increase. Um, but we can expect that variation. So we can go to the next slide. So this slide shows the silage yield of early and later corn he, uh, hybrids at uh, Lacombe and Lethbridge. So we have a, a, a cold location at Lacombe, probably the coldest place that you would want to grow corn on the prairies uh, versus Lethbridge. And the average corn heat units for Lacombe is somewhere around 1,850 and at Lethbridge, we're at 2,200. And we have a couple of, of, of hybrids in common. And the things that we can see here is that uh, if you look at Lacombe first, uh, you can see that hybrids that are rated above 2,000 here uh, are yielding more than the, the hybrid, the earliest hybrid, 39F44, uh, the earliest one. It happens though, and we'll come back to this again, that this early hybrid with the low yield was the only hybrid that could have been harvested for silage between 30 and 40 percent dry matter. The rest of them were all um, uh, lower dry matter than would be recommended to making silage. We go to Lethbridge with more corn heat units and we see that <clears throat> most of the corn heat unit, cor corn hybrids on average, um, yielded more than you would have at Lacombe. So the average yield at the warmer location is considerably higher. And most of these hybrids were able in, in, uh, in most years uh, to be harvested before frost between 30 and 40% dry matter. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so Vern's talked a lot about yield and um, I wanna come back to yield and quality. So the question then is, should the emphasis be on yield or should be on nutritional value or can you have both? Well, I think Vern has convinced us that in a shorter growing area at least, there is a trade-off between yield and uh, quality. So if you're a feedlot producer and corn silage is included in the diet of finishing cattle as a roughage source or a source of effective fiber, then quality probably doesn't matter too much. But if you're feeding corn silage to cattle as an energy source, the main energy source, then of course quality becomes uh, very important. And um, the, I guess the same you could say would be true if you were purchasing your corn silage, uh, you'd wanna get the maximum energy content per ton of feed, uh, especially if the price of uh, per ton is the same for low versus high energy um, feed. So at this point, um, our plan was to throw out a few questions to our audience. Uh, Stacey, I'll turn back to you. For sure. So the first poll question here, this is your chance as the audience to participate in the webinar. So you can select the answer that most applies to you. So are you currently, the question is, are you currently feeding corn silage on your operation? And the answers are yes, no, or that you're not a producer. So go ahead and select the one that most applies. I'll give you guys a couple more minutes here to get your seconds to get your answers in, and then we'll show you what they are. And your answers here are anonymous to everybody else watching the webinar. 
All right. So it looks like for the results, about 27% uh, of people are. Um, just over <laughs> half are not feeding corn silage, and then the other quarter are not producers. Okay, well, that's interesting. It sounds like there's quite a few people interested in corn silage, but maybe just thinking about it. Yes. And then the other questions here. So the next question for you, do you routinely send samples of your corn silage for feed testing? So those of you who um, are feeding corn silage, your options are yes or no, and then I don't feed corn silage is the third answer there. And once again, I'll give you a couple more seconds to get any of your final answers in. So it looks like the answers, um, about 23% are testing feed, uh, feed testing their silage, 10% say they're not, and then 68 fall in that not feeding corn silage group. So we have one last poll question for you guys tonight, which is a skill testing question for you. <laughs> so a corn silage, a corn silage with blank will maximize growth weight of cattle. So whether that is high protein, high starch content, high fiber content, which is neutral determinant fiber, or high fiber digestibility, which is NDFD, which is what you would see on your Feed test. I'll just leave it open for a couple more seconds. This one takes a little bit more reading to get through all the answers here. All right, so it looks like 25% think that it's high protein, 41% say high starch, and 34% say high fiber digestibility. So I'll turn it over to you again, Karen, and I'm sure you'll help us with the answer for that. Okay, well, that was a bit of a trick question. Um, and I'm hoping in the next few slides, we can convince you that uh, it's probably a combination uh, but certainly we're looking for high starch content and high fiber digestibility. Protein is less important because the protein content of corn silage quite, is quite low. So you're mostly feeding the corn silage as an energy source, which is dependent on starch content and digestibility of the fiber. So on this next slide, um, we, I wanted to sort of get into the nitty gritty of uh, nutritional value of corn silage. And it's quite complex compared to some other forages, because corn silage is a combination of forage and grain. So the forage um, is really the fiber from the leaves, the husk, the stalk, and the grain is, of course, from the cobs, and it's going to supply starch. So the fiber, which we usually measure as neutral detergent fiber, it's partially digested, maybe 40 to 60 percent digestible. Well, the starch provides a lot of energy because it's highly digestible up to almost 100%. Therefore, the nutritional value of corn silage will really depend on the proportions of fiber and starch you get. So how much cob versus um, fiber and how digestible each of those uh, components is. So in the next slide, Um, you'll see that as the plant matures over the growing season, there's a change in the ratio of forage to grain. So early in the season, the plants only leaves and stalk. But eventually in the growing season, the cobs are formed, and then they begin to fill with grain. So if you have a hybrid that requires a long growing season to mature, or if you harvest it early because it's the end of the growing season and it's frost is going to occur, then the starch content is going to be low at, you know, maybe um, 20%. If you continue um, in the growing season, uh, if you have a hybrid that is, matures fast, 
or in other words, it has a low corn heat unit, unit rating, or if, if you have a longer growing season, then the plants are going to be at a later stage of a development at harvest, and you're going to have more starch because you have proportionally more cob and less forage. So, Stacy, if you go to the next slide, so there you see the late harvest or early frost, and then if you go again, Stacy, the next one is you have a early hybrid is going to have a higher starch content at at uh, end of um, of the growing season. So if you go to the next slide, what I wanted to show you here is some values for um, the nutritional composition of corn silage. So these values in this table I took from the new beef NRC tables, and it represents over 200,000 samples that were sent to three labs in the Midwestern part of the U.S. So that's mostly for beef cattle and grown in uh, the corn belt of the U.S. So uh, you might say ideal growing conditions for, for corn. And what I wanted to point out here was in, these, um, in this database, you see the average starch content is about 33%. So a third of, uh, a third of the material you're, you're feeding is starch. And as starch goes up in the plant, fiber goes down. So it's a dilution effect. So you have about 43% fiber, neutral detergent fiber, and only 8% crude protein. So the protein content in corn silage is actually quite low and not variable. It's really um, a, a narrow window for crude protein and relatively low compared to some other forages. But if you go to the next slide, what I wanted to show you here were some values for Canada. So I I show these values on two different lines. So the bottom line is for the prairies, and those numbers come from a study that Vern and I uh, ran in Western Canada. So the samples were from Alberta and Manitoba over three different years and a number of locations and hybrids. And then the rest of Canada, I obtained those values. Uh, there were over 700 samples. Um, from uh, an, an analytical lab that was mainly analyzing samples from Ontario and Quebec. So what I wanted to point out here was, uh, once again, the starch content. So we saw in the U.S. the average was 33. The rest of Canada, which is mainly Ontario and Quebec, is about 30, plus or minus 6. And then in the short-growing season areas of the prairies, we have a much lower starch content, on average 24%. But what you'll notice is the high variation. So 24% plus or minus 18. So that means in some years with some hybrids in some locations, we were getting starch contents very high, the high 30s. Whereas in other cases, other hybrids, other years, other locations, we were getting starch contents well below 15% and sometimes even below 10%. Well, if you're growing corn silage and you're getting a value for starch content below 10, you really are probably growing the wrong hybrid or you should perhaps think about growing a different forage. Um, so the other thing I wanted to show you on this, um, uh, in these numbers is the fiber. So in the shorter season where areas where we have a higher, lower starch content, we're getting a much higher fiber content. So our corn silage tends to have less starch, more fiber. And as a result, the digestibility, which is measured by total digestible nutrient, the TDN value, is considerably lower um, in a shorter season area where we may be getting less starch and more fiber. And you can see 65% plus or minus 8. So that means that some of those silages were down in the uh, low 50s, which means they were similar to feeding a low-quality alfalfa or, or grass hay. So th the point of these slides, show, uh, for me at least, is to show that there's a lot of variability in the nutrient composition of corn silage, and that variability will increase as you are growing corn silage in a shorter growing season area. So in the next slide, I, what I wanted to show you there was um, what the impact of, those, uh, of that variability will be in terms of the intake potential and the energy content of the silage. 
So to maximize intake of beef cattle, you want a low fiber content, you want low NDF content, and you want high NDF digestibility. And that's because with a forage, bulk fill in the rumen limits intake. So the animal needs to ruminate so that chew its cut over the day to reduce the particle size. The microbes in the rumen need to digest the fiber. And that will help it clear out of the rumen to relieve some of that bulk fill and so the animal can eat more fiber. So fiber really limits the rate of this intake. So to maximize intake, we're looking for low fiber, low NDF, and high digestibility. To maximize energy content, we want starch and we want highly digestible fiber. And that's because one unit of starch supplies roughly twice the amount of energy as one unit of fiber, unless that fiber is highly digested. So in terms of nutrient composition, those variations in NDF content and starch content are going to impact intake, digestibility, energy content, and performance of your animals. So in the next slide, what I did here was I um, attempted to show the difference um, that you would expect by feeding two corn two corn silages that differed in starch content and NDF content. So what I did here is I put those values into the new beef NRC model and I projected what the average daily gain would be for growing animals between 250 and 400 kgs fed a diet almost exclusively of corn silage with a protein source. So with the 32% starch uh, silage, you could expect almost 1.5 kgs of gain per day, whereas with the 20% starch silage, you would be at about one kilogram per day of gain. So to get the same gain with that 20% starch silage, you'd have to feed more concentrate and you'd have to feed a, rush, a ration that was about 50% corn silage, 50% grain. So that means that those two corn silages are going to differ in their value, in their, in their, uh, the value in terms of um, what it's going to take to feed the animals for a certain amount of gain. So um, you can do that, uh, you can figure out using your own costs what the value of the higher energy content would mean to you based on your own cost. So if you go to the next slide then, so far we've talked a lot about the importance of starch and cob development, especially in shorter season growing areas. So the goal is to produce high starch. So then the question is, when would be the best time to harvest the crop to maximize that starch content? So in the next slide, um, harvesting the silage, regardless of starch content, really has to be about obtaining the optimum dry matter content for ensiling. So for bags and pile silo, uh, silage, uh, silos and pit silos, the ideal dry matter content is 32 to 38% dry matter. So that's going to optimize the fermentation. So if you plant a hybrid that is slow to mature and it's very wet at the time of harvest because frost is impending and you have a dry matter content below 30, you're going to have seepage from the silo and the potential for um, harmful bacteria such as clostridia that uh, end up into a butyric acid fermentation or you're gonna have high fermentation acids and potentially low intake of the silage. And then if you have silage that's too dry at the time of harvest, it's really hard to pack that material. So it's very hard to get an anaerobic fermentation. So as a result, you get poor fermentation, the potential for spoilage, molds, mycotoxins, and low intake. So Regardless of the starch content of your silage, the optimum uh, time of, of harvest has to be to ensure optimum fermentation, and that has to be driven by the dry matter content at harvest. 
So in the next slide, having said that, of course, the goal when you harvest the material is to have cobs that are going to be at the right stage of development that are going to maximize your starch content. So you want to be at a half milk line or more. So if you see in the top left-hand side of this screen, you can see the milk line. And in that photograph, you can see the line, the difference between the light yellow and the dark yellow, it's about halfway up the kernel. And that's at about half milk line. So if the milk line is greater, so the kernels are at the dent or dough or milk stage that you can see on the left, on the bottom left, the kernels are going to be low in, in starch content and less than ideal. So you want to be able to harvest at that higher milk line. But Stacey, if you press the next animation, the point I want to make is that milk line alone is not a very good indicator of whole plant moisture content. So to know when to harvest, milk line is important, but what you need to do is go into the field, chop down five or six or seven whole plants at random, run them through a garden shedder, and then take that material, a subsample of material, and use a coster moisture tester or a microwave to analyze the dry matter content and then follow that because the crop can dry down quite quickly. So it really has to be driven by dry matter content. So at that point then, I'm going to turn it over now to Vern. Vern? We're having, a, <clears throat> we're having a bit of a pause because I was muted and now I'm unmuted. So okay. um, um, we're, back on, uh, we're back on to uh, looking at relationships uh, between yield, uh, maturity. Um, when I say yield, I mean silage yield or whole plant dry matter yield and uh, grain yield because there are big trade-offs. Uh, Karen has talked to you about uh, the importance of starch content, and uh, that really means uh, uh, at what point grain is grain yield is at in relation to its maximum yield, and uh, the ratio of the grain material to the whole plant. So that kind of gives you an idea of the starch content, and maturity also affects the um, uh, digestibility of the uh, fiber portion or the vegetative part of the plant. Um, when we're harvesting corn silage within a zone, um, it, it depends where we are. So I'm going to concentrate more about short season zones than I am uh, uh, about uh, warmer locations. But um, if you look at the, uh, the upper curve here, you'll see as we get into this area when we want to harvest silage in this gray area between um, uh, uh, close to 30 to 40 percent dry matter, um, we can see we're not increasing very much in, in whole plant yield or dry matter yield, but our grain content uh, continues to increase. Uh, when we're in our short season areas, we depend on getting silking uh, done on the corn uh, crop as early as we can because we're limited in the amount of time we have to fill grain or the grain filling period um, by frost uh, that will probably come in early September. Um, so where we are at in terms of the grain filling period, uh, when we get to um, the middle of August, uh, when the temperatures start to decrease, uh, really impacts the uh, grain maturity, the starch content, and the moisture content of, of the forage. So we need to ensure that we have an early enough hybrid. So in a short season area, what may happen is that um, we'll get to about 28% dry matter. Uh, the kernels will be milky in texture. They won't really have too much starch. You couldn't really find a milk line in the, in the, in the grain. And then um, we'll sort of stall in the accumulation of starch in the kernels. And our grain yield or our whole plant yield is not going to increase very much. 
and our kernel moistures may be even, our moisture content and our kernels may be even higher than the green line that we have here. We may be around 60%. So in those cases, these sorts of things have driven producers to wait for frost uh, to get themselves into the, uh, uh, into the proper zone for making silage. On the other hand, if we've chosen a, a relatively uh, early hybrid in a warmer location, and we're in this zone in about 35% dry matter, uh, at that point, there's no, there's the only gain out of uh, waiting a little bit longer would be uh, a, a slight increase in starch content and a slight increase in um, uh, grain yield. Um, if we wait for frost at that point, we could get pushed into the two dry zone beyond 40% dry matter. Um, if we're in a really warm location versus a cold location, like perhaps if we're in uh, Lacombe, Alberta and central Alberta versus Elm Creek and southern Manitoba, uh, even though we're in a, a position of 35% dry matter, uh, the kernels in uh, the cooler location uh, could be up over 50% moisture where the kernels in the warmer location could be 40%. And so the, the starch content of those kernels is a bit hard to judge, but um, a betting person would probably say that the higher starch content would be um, in the southern Manitoba warmer location where the moisture content is lower. Okay, we can move on. So we harvested corn for silage before and after frost in uh, central and southern Alberta and at Elm Creek in Manitoba. And this graph shows a summary of starch content uh, versus silage dry matter percentage. So in the short season area at Lacombe with one early variety that was 2000 corn heat units, we struggled to um, both make it into this whole plant dry matter zone, although we were able to with average corn heat units. Uh, but when we did, uh, we were just in around uh, the 20 to 25% uh, starch content. So one out of six varieties that we planted were able to make that level. Uh, when we were in the warmer locations and Lethbridge had greater than average corn heat units in the years that we were there, and especially in Elm Creek and Manitoba, uh, we had no problems uh, uh, approaching uh, 30 and 35 plus, and uh, there were more issues with uh, producing overdry corn silage. But if we're risk managers in short season areas, there's a negative relationship between starch content and hybrid corn heat unit rating. So selecting a hybrid with a lower rating will help increase starch content and, and more or less ensure uh, that we reach a certain level of starch content uh, that we may desire to have. Then it becomes a matter of watching the whole plant dry matter percentage and harvesting at the, the appropriate time, because there's not much to gain in terms of uh, whole plant yield at that point. It's just managing moisture content and starch content. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So on this slide, this is really good work that was carried out in Wisconsin by Joe Lauer um, and a, a graduate student at the time. And uh, this slide shows uh, fiber digestibility. And we've talked up to this point about uh, starch and starch is really important. Uh, starch may be 90% digestible. And we expect that about the time we're going to make corn silage uh, towards the uh, uh, the lower right hand, the, the right hand side of this uh, graph that uh, we should be somewhere around 40% um, uh, fiber digestibility. And in silage, the silage will have a lower fiber digestibility than the fresh forage. But what we have is a trend towards a decreasing uh, amount of, uh, of fiber digestibility or concentration of fiber digestibility as the plant matures. And we kind of have a competition between, or a management between managing the amount of starch we have, which is highly digestible, and a decreasing uh, fiber digestibility. Um, so I think that, uh, and uh, uh, one additional point, I guess, is that uh, what we found was that uh, 
at any particular time, we would have a higher fiber digestibility in our cooler locations that we studied over the prairies than the warmer locations. So we can go on to the next slide. Many people in Alberta, and I'm not sure, I think in some other parts of the prairies, um, have gotten into the habit of weeding for frost before uh, harvesting corn. And sometimes this just happens to people that frost comes before we're ready to harvest. Um, but our goal should be to uh, manage our corn hybrids, choosing corn hybrids which are suited to our area and to harvest before frost if possible. Um, so a question would be if uh, dry matter content is less than 20, uh, 32%, uh, should we delay harvest to extend the growing season and, and what happens with uh, if frost occurs? Um, well, um, what we did be previously is we looked at uh, the graph which, which said that as we approach 30% um, um, dry matter, but we're below 32%, uh, we are closing in on the time when our whole plant yield is maximizing. So the best we can hope for is a little bit of an increase in um, whole plant yield, uh, perhaps some increase in grain yield and, and some increase in starch. Um, what we found is that um, we might have a marginal increase in starch content depending on the stage of the plant um, when it's frozen, um, but it, it's not very much. So if we go to the next slide, we can uh, look at the impact of frost uh, on, um, on, um, on dry matter content. <clears throat> so this is information that we have from 2013 at Lacombe, and we showed you some information about this before. We have corn hybrids that range from 2,000 corn heat units uh, up to, to 2,150 corn heat units. And um, if we look at the yield before and after frost and um, these yields were taken, um, uh, we waited until we had a forecast of frost. And in this particular year, we really only had uh, a couple of days or two to three days difference between before and after frost. And um, in this case, there was uh, really no increase in yield uh, at all uh, after frost. So the reason for waiting for frost would not be because of yield. And um, our later hybrids had higher yields than our early hybrid. But our silage dry matter, you can see that before frost, the silage dry matter of the early hybrid, um, Pioneer 39F44, was already in the zone and probably could be ready to be harvested in any event. Um, uh, it, it would have had somewhere in the low 20 percentages of starch content at that point and frost pushed it over the 40% dry matter level. And in fact, any of the hybrids that were close to 30% uh, generally got pushed into the uh, lower areas. And the fact is, is that if we were to look at the starch content, while these later hybrids marginally increased in the amount of starch that they had, and we're talking maybe two to three percentage, and that might seem like a lot to you, but um, not very much, um, we didn't increase the starch content of the later hybrids uh, to a greater uh, level than we already had in the early hybrid. So the message would be is that if you can uh, try and optimize your yield and maturity uh, within the zone that you have and you'll probably end up uh, with um, a fairly high certainty of a given starch level for that area. Okay, we can go to the next slide. One of the things that we deal with is um, when we're growing corn, we, we do have some different types of, of corn that we grow. They're all hybrid corn, of course, and most of them are uh, single cross hybrids. Um, when we go to the very early types, um, early areas or new areas of corn production, we sometimes end up with flint type uh, endosperm uh, hybrids versus dent types. and um, the, um, the morphology of the kernel or the way the kernel looks um, um, is often used to stage the time of harvest and, and there's a bit of a difference and there uh, with the, um, this, this, 
the endosperm type uh, and, uh, and the stage, and also its impact on um, starch digestibility. So on the left-hand side is uh, a, a white uh, dent uh, maize, and, I'm, and, and it was not grown in Canada. It's an African maize, and I'm using it to illustrate the difference in the kernel type. In other words, the heavy dent uh, uh, in the kernel, and those kernels would mature, and if we pulled kernels out of them, we'd easily be able to see the black layer uh, at the tip of the kernel that indicates physiological maturity. The two, um, the two ears in the middle are 2,000 corn heat units, and uh, they were harvested in, uh, says, 2014, uh, September 17th at Lacombe, uh, probably just after frost. And those are dent endosperm types, and you can see that they, those kernels appear tight, and, and uh, you couldn't really dent those kernels with uh, your, your finger. It's hard uh, endosperm. Uh, on the end of them. And the difference between the the dent and the flint endosperm is that the starchy endosperm of the um, uh, dent uh, corn hybrids um, collapses as it dries and matures uh, where and, and, and hardens just as the um, uh, flint types do, but um, the uh, flint type kernels are much harder. The kernels uh, of the ear on the right are immature dent kernels <clears throat> and can be mistaken for later maturity than they really are. So the, the 2200 corn heat unit variety that was uh, on the right hand side was, was pulled off the corn at the, at the stalks at the same time as the flint. And it does appear dented, uh, but the, um, uh, the kernels would have stopped filling due to frost earlier. Uh, and stop filling with starch, which helps the kernels dry. And uh, really what we're seeing is a loss of moisture and shrunken kernels there and the collapse of the kernel into a dent. But it isn't, doesn't mean that it's nearly at the same stage of maturity as a normally maturing dent uh, type uh, that hasn't been frozen. And if we looked at the kernel moisture under the flint types, even though they appear hard, um, they probably are somewhere around 50% moisture and is not as dry as you might think they are. And there wouldn't, it would be still hard to find uh, a milk line in those kernels uh, uh, anywhere close to the half, half milk line area. So also another thing that Karen has looked at, uh, flint versus dent, and, and we know that there, there isn't much flint material being used out there uh, on the prairies, but there's some. Um, and uh, Karen is looking at the impact of the vitreous endosperm or the hard endosperm of the flint versus uh, the, the dents in uh, starch digestibility at a particular stage uh, of maturity. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so with that information, and I also mentioned before that the digestibility of starch can be as uh, almost 100% in, in cattle, but that's only if the rumen bacteria can gain access to the starch, and that's not always the case with the hard, dry kernels. Um, so to maximize the digestibility of starch in the rumen, uh, kernel processing uh, on the harvester should be conducted. Uh, so um, this will allow you to harvest the corn at slightly higher dry matter content, if you can, and um, that helps maximize the starch content if you have the growing um, season before the, uh, the, be, before the uh, onset of uh, frost. And um, going back to what Vern was saying about the fact that some of our shorter season hybrids have some degree of flint genetics, it could be also important for short season hybrids because the corn with flint genetics have a um, higher uh, percentage of very hard or vitreous endosperm that makes it less digestible or less accessible to the rumen bacteria. And it's also important for corn silage harvested after frost because, as Vern mentioned, the kernels dry down very quickly uh, with the onset of frost and they become very hard. So we've done some research looking at that and what our research would show generally is that the rate of availability of cornstarch in the rumen or the digestibility of cornstarch in the rumen 
is inversely affected by kernel hardness. So the harder the kernels, uh, the slower the rate of digestion and the lower the rumen digestibility. So it really helps the kernel process so that the bacteria can penetrate into the grain, into the kernels to ferment that corn. Now, obviously, the longer that the corn stays in the silo, the greater the starch digestibility uh, in the rumen. So it's also going to be really helpful if you're planning on uh, feeding that corn silage before three to six months before the, uh, the fermentation is complete. So kernel processing will definitely help. So there's a lot of different ways of assessing whether processing is adequate. There's a lot of different recommendations, but essentially what you're looking for is kernels that are broken in at least four pieces. So some laboratories have a kernel processing index score. So you're looking for a score that's greater than 70%, meaning more than 70% of the starch will pass through a 4.75 millimeter sieve. But essentially a very easy way of looking at that is uh, the way uh, the recommendation of DuPont Pioneer, essentially you fill a one liter container up with corn silage as it's coming out of the harvester and you look at how many of the kernels are processed and you're ideally looking for no more than two whole kernels. And if it's more than four kernels, you definitely have inadequate processing. So the next slide, I'm just gonna wrap up here in the next few slides. Essentially, regardless of the hybrid you grow, the conditions, you, uh, the agronomics that you use or uh, what the nutrient composition is of the silage, you have to use good silage management. And so if the cattle don't eat it, the silage because it's poorly fermented, then the energy content of the silage, it really doesn't matter at all. So just going through some of the fundamentals then of um, silage making, um, they're the same regardless of where the silage is grown. If you go to the next um, slide, Stacy. So there's three main key elements to fermentation. One, you need the pH to drop. And for corn, you're looking for um, less than 4.2. And that's going to prevent the growth of molds and harmful bacteria that will um, increase the butyric acid. And that butyric acid fermentation is sometimes, uh, if you've ever smelt really a really strong smelling um, silage, it often means that there's some butyric acid um, and that's very uh, unpalatable for cattle and it leads to a lot of spoilage. And so you want low pH to, um, so that the right bacteria can start to ferment and prevent heating. Um, high acid fermentation, so it, we're looking for a high lactic acid concentration in the silage. Um, that's going to help preserve the silage. And we're really looking for anaerobic environments. So exclusion, excluding all the oxygen will help uh, preserve the silage. So to obtain that, in the next slide, I wanna talk about chop length. Chop length is really important for corn silage. And that's really important, especially if your silage is going into the silo dry. So the theoretical length of cut for so a corn silage, the recommended length is three eighths of an inch to a half inch. If you're using kernel processing, you can process a little longer at three quarters inch. But what I wanted to point out here is that theoretical length of cut. So that's a setting that you would use. But what you really want to know is what the actual particle size is of the material as it comes off the chopper. So you can do that by using a series of sieves. In this photo, you can see the Penn State particle separator. That's one way of sieving material. So you can sieve out the material and look at what's retained on the various sieves. For corn silage, you really don't want a lot, a lot on the top sieve. You don't want a lot of leaves and stalks and that very um, coarse material. So you want less than 15 or less than 12% on that top sieve, which is a three quarter inch sieve. So in terms of chop length, it, the finer the chop length, the better in terms of promoting fermentation in the silo. So the finer you can get the silage, the better in terms of your fermentation. It also reduces sorting. But the problem is, is if you have very finely chopped silage, you have less physically effective fiber. So that would matter 
if you're feeding the corn silage as the main component of your diet to supply effective fiber. So if you have other things in the diet, like hay or straw, then the physically effective fiber aspect of corn silage is probably not important. Or if you're feeding a diet that's really high in forage or high in corn silage, then physically effective fiber is less important. So the optimum balance between ferment, uh, the optimum particle length really does depend on a little bit the, uh, on the type of ration that you're feeding and what the job is that you're expecting the corn silage to do in terms terms of uh, physically effective fiber. So in the next slide then, once the silo, the, si the material is in the silo, it needs to be adequately packed to exclude air and to avoid heating. So you want to prevent any kind of temperature increase. Um, you want to initiate the fermentation to prevent the mold and the fungal growth. And you, to do that, the silage needs to be packed at the right density. So there's a lot of information on the internet, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of numbers, but there's a lot of studies that have done on that. There's a lot of good uh, guidelines on that. Um, I've given Stacy, I think, a couple websites that you can check out later if you want more information on proper ensiling techniques. Um, uh, but I will mention that there have been studies looking at density of corn silage in, in commercial silos, and it is quite variable. And if you don't get the right density, you are going to be looking at uh, considerable dry matter losses that cost you a lot of money. The other important thing is you're looking for anaerobic fermentation. So you really do have to cover quickly as you load your silo, and you don't want to skimp on the cover. You really want a thick a dual la layer cover or a complete oxygen barrier film. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but in the next slide, I thought it was quite interesting. So I, uh, I'll put that up as my last slide. I read this paper not too long ago and it, I, I found it quite interesting. It was a survey of Californian dairy farms. So I thought it was relevant for beef because these dairy farms were quite large. Uh, there was 160 farms and the average cow size uh, was about uh, 1,500 cows. So these are dairy farms that would be interested in high quality in terms of nutrition, but also high yield because they're feeding a lot of cows and they're managing a lot of volume of silage. They were using mostly bunker and pile silos, so I think it's relevant. And I thought some of these numbers could be interesting in terms of a benchmark. So 32% of the, uh, of the uh, farm surveyed were weighing every load delivered into the silo because they were keeping an eye on what was going in, but also the loads coming out to have a handle on some of the losses that were occurring. But during harvesting, um, they 67% were determining routinely dry matter content of silage was being harvested and put into the silo. 80% were actually measuring particle size as it was going into the silo to make sure it was fine enough. 92% um, were using kernel processing. So I think it's quite uh, clear that uh, kernel processing is quite widely accepted in terms of improving the digestibility uh, and the energy content. More than half of these uh, farms surveyed were using inoculants. Um, all of the silos were being covered, but 68% of them were being covered in 24 hours of filling. And 51% um, were using temporary covers while they filled because it often took much longer than 24 hours. So they were covering as they went. 71% um, were using double plastic covers or 88% uh, of those were using the oxygen barrier films that have very low perme permeability that really keep um, the silage uh, airtight. And all of them, of course, were using uh, weights or tires to weigh them down. So just I thought it was interesting in terms of some of the bench, um, some of the numbers in terms of potential benchmarking. So the last slide then is our conclusions. Um, Vern, I'll turn it over for, to you for that first slide on the conclusions. Okay, so nutritive value of corn silage is highly variable, and we didn't tell you we didn't we we think that I, we think that that is uh, one of the most important things for you to know. But at the same time, we're not telling you all of this to scare you away from growing corn silage. We're giving you this information to help you um, 
to uh, do a better job and make better decisions. So um, we said that both because of uh, making good silage and determining where you are in with respect to the, the, the growth point of harvesting, analyze dry matter, starch, uh, neutral detergent fiber and fiber digestibility contact, content, uh, select a hybrid adapted uh, to corn heat unit rating for your location. That's probably the most important decision to make. Uh, harvest at an optimum dry matter content or uh, harvest uh, somewhere between 30 and 40% uh, dry matter. Have it narrower than that, as, as Karen suggested, 32% to 38 if you can manage it. Be easier to manage it if you follow the run up to the harvest. Uh, uh, dry matter, the harvest uh, as the crop is standing rather than waiting for frost. Frost is unpredictable. Later maturing hybrids uh, with, with higher corn heat unit rating than the uh, area of adaption uh, may not reach the desired dry matter content before frost occurs and probably will have a lower starch content than we really want. Okay, and the final um, slide then, just to recap on the, I mean, if we're growing corn silage because of the potential high energy due to the starch content, you really want to maximize that digestibility of the starch. So I do recommend kernel processing, um, especially if you have frozen corn silage or short in silage time before you start to feed your silage before it's fully fermented. And obviously, you really need to think about using the best in silage techniques that you can because you want to maximize the nutritive value of what you 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 grow and and uh, and and uh, and sile. So, with that, um, turn it back over to Stacy. And thank you, everybody, for bearing with us <laughs> with all the technical difficulties. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we'll open it up to questions here. So um, thanks to both of our presenters for a great presentation. So now is the time um, you can type your questions in. So please type them into the chat box on the side of your screen. If your control panel has closed, you should see an orange arrow near the top. If you click that arrow, it'll expand again and you'll be able to use the chat box to um, type your questions into. And then I'll read them out and we'll hear from our speakers tonight. So if there is someone specific you wanna address it to, go ahead. If not, um, I'll open it up to both of you. So the first question actually came in via Twitter to uh, during your presentation, Karen. So this person was asking about protein levels. Um, they're saying that the protein levels in their silage are around 78% with 68% moisture. Can or should they be feeding it to pregnant cows eight months along, or do they run the risk of getting calves that are too big? Um, running, so the protein level was seven to 8%, and they're wanting to feed it to, did, did you say cows? At cows at about, eight months pregnant, so in late gestation, and worried about if calves are gonna get too big for them. Too big. Um, mm -hmm. well, no, I think you could feed the corn silage, definitely. Um, uh, you might wanna supplement the uh, corn silage is a little low on protein, 78%, so you wanna be supplementing that with a source of nitrogen or crude protein um, to, uh, because uh, protein content is uh, going to be a little low there. Um, so to maximize the uh, nutritive value of the corn silage, you want to be supplementing with protein. I don't know, Vern, if you want to comment on that as well? Well, um, I, think, I think you're on the right track there. Um, uh, what really probably an issue may be is uh, at that uh, point of pregnancy or with those cows, you probably don't want to give the cows free access or feed um, the 100% ration of corn silage at that time. Um, you may just need to check um, the quantity of um, 
of feed that the cows may need. And um, um, the corn silage is probably going to be somewhere in the order of uh, 65 to 70 percent TDN, which is on the high end of what you would be mm -hmm. feeding to uh, uh, gestating cows. Um, so, so you, you, you I, I would just recommend keeping an eye on body condition score, and you'd probably want to be feeding restrict, restricted amounts of corn silage, or you could be blending off that corn silage with something else. Yes, uh, at the earlier part of the gestation, maybe not quite that far along, it's not uncommon for producers for producers that are used to doing this to feed, uh, you know, 30% corn silage and um, the rest as straw or 50-50 or uh, kind of work that way. It, it, it even reduces the cost of your uh, ration. Um, so body condition is a, is a good way to do it, but uh, don't count on uh, um, just providing free access as sometimes we see. Uh, to a bunker silo with cows or, um, you know, feeding the entire ration with corn silage. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we do have a few questions, but not that many. So if you do want to get your questions in, type them in here right away. Um, if not, we'll wrap up once the ones I have are done. So the next question here is talking about um, covering your silage pit. So if silaging is taking course or taking place over the course of a couple days, when is the time when you should be covering it as you go? Like how many days, how many days can it go uncovered essentially? I think is what they're asking. Okay. Well, it's always, I mean, in the ideal world, you'd want to cover it right away because leaving the silo uncovered it will lead to losses. So, but there's also the practicality. So, um, it's a very difficult job to cover it. Um, but on the other hand, it's also very profitable because it will improve dry matter recovery and uh, quality, et cetera. So, as I showed in that dairy study in California, uh, uh, like almost half of the people were covering it every uh, every sort of as they went. So they were covering the silo as they were filling um, every every day, or at least within 24 hours of filling the silo. But it's, it's you know, it is a trade-off because it is difficult and it's a lot of work. But the sooner you cover the silo, the less uh, spoilage and losses you will have. So there is no magic number, but um, it's definitely a lot of work, but it's worth it. All right. Um, the next question here, and I'll open this one up to both of you. Um, what would be your like number one piece of advice for somebody who is just starting corn um, to feed corn silage for the first time? So I will I will take a stab at that one first. So if you're starting to feed it, my advice would be well, first of all, um, I would definitely recommend the feed feed testing your silage because it it can be so variable especially depending where you are so especially in shorter growing areas it can be so variable so corn silage can be almost no grain or can be really high in grain and so getting your cattle onto that ration really depends on how much starches into that in, in that ration so if you're a novice it's especially very important to analyze the um, nutrient content and especially the starch content because that's going to really help you um, understand what kind of silage you have and what kind of ration you want to be feeding. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's a little bit difficult to um, answer that question um, right off the top. Um, because we don't really know uh, what the what the person is uh, feeding, but um, often when people are feeding for the first time, uh, underestimating the um, the first of all the value of having that corn silage in that um, 32 to 38 percent dry matter range is pretty important. Um, when you start trying to feed uh, new cattle or green cattle, if you like, 
or um, uh, lightweight uh, weaned calves or something like that. And the corn silage is not um, uh, uh, optimum in terms of moisture content. Some feeding problems can be initiated. And so you, in, in other words, the, the high moisture silage uh, tends to be a bit acidic. Um, it's uh, high in moisture. And uh, how those uh, young animals are initiated to feeding um, can cause some problems, particularly if you're buying in cattle and initiating them, uh, getting them ready to, uh, to, to go on full feed, because you can start some acidosis. So knowing the characteristics of your silage and trying to ensure that it's as close to optimum as possible uh, is really important, because you might have to make some quick decisions about um, how you manage it. All right, thank you very much. So this is our last question here. So if you do have anything else, get them in right away. If not, we'll wrap up. So this is talking about when you were showing the uh, Manitoba agriculture budget, Vern. Um, it says eight ton, per, eight ton per acre, it looks like about $35 a ton standing. If we add custom harvesting, what would that add for the cost for silage in the bunker on a ton basis? I hear a $900 per hour cost for custom harvesting. Oh, that's an awful lot of uh, economics to answer in a very short period of time. I'm not sure that I can do that. But what I would t what I would tell the person to do uh, is to go to the go to the Manitoba Agriculture website and access the um, uh, access the the spreadsheet and to determine those um, uh, determine those costs um, because they're all there. Um, and that's why those good people uh, do the work that they do. So um, I can't answer that off the top of my head. And um, uh, a lot of that information is available right in the spreadsheets. For sure. So I, when I send out the follow-up email for this webinar with a link to watch the recording, it also includes a link to some supplemental information and I will make sure to include that uh, spreadsheet as well. So one last question just next um, when feeding corn silage, how many pounds per cow per day is recommended? They talk about um, for wean calves as well as pregnant cows. Is it different? Oh, that's so. Yeah. So uh, what, what are we what are we feeding? We're feeding uh, pregnant. Uh, we're pre we're feeding gestating cows in the winter. Yes. As well as weaned calves. There were two separate questions, I guess. Oh, weaned, weaned calves. And pregnant cows. Yeah. Oh, um, I, I, I would first of all not recommend feeding um, a full feed of corn silage to um, um, those gestating cows. I, um, I would be. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of guessing here uh, because, as Karen said, uh, one of the things that the producer has to do is to, um, um, uh, one of the things that the producer has to do is, is feed test, and it's going to vary. Um, so, yeah. you know, we have to assume that uh, maybe the corn silage is going to be 68, 70% TDN, and then you may be blending that off with, uh, 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 a lower quality hay that might be, you know, uh, 58 to 60 percent uh, TDN or even straw, which might be lower than that. So, you know, um, uh, when we when we're uh, working with cows, uh, we figure that in the early part of gestation that um, uh, they should have somewhere around um, uh, <clears throat> 10 to 12. Uh, um, megacals of uh, energy uh, per day for say uh, uh, a 650 kilogram cow or you know close to a 1500 kilogram cow well half of what the cow needs could come from corn silage and the other half could come from uh, from hay if it was straight hay maybe the cow would uh, require 15 kilograms uh, if it was corn silage she might require somewhere around seven to eight 
so you would have to determine uh, uh, the the average of that somehow if it was 50 50 what uh, the cow would require mm -hmm. then for uh, I don't know Karen do you want to comment on that well I just wanted to make sure that the, that you, the people understood you were talking on a dry matter basis right yeah yeah on a yeah. dry matter basis yeah, yeah exactly um, and uh, as fed you know you're it would be more corn silage uh, than uh, than dry hay. Mm -hmm. All right. it, it's Thank a difficult. Yeah, I was just going to say it's a difficult question mm -hmm. because it really depends on the quality of that silage, and if it's really high in starch, you want to be really careful. You don't want to be causing acidosis in your pregnant cows. So, yeah, it's yeah, a really yeah. difficult question to answer without seeing the silage and the you know drilling down a little bit into the specifics. And sure. and it would be an expensive it would be an and you know it, it would be an expensive diet for uh, a dry cow feeding uh, uh, corn silage of fairly high quality because you go into the uh, the the double the cost of what it would cost to grow something like triticale uh, than having maybe a similar yield uh, so you have to kind of uh, that's one uh, that you would really want to pencil out. Plus, Karen mentioned the, the variability in quality of corn silage. Well, there's variability in the quality of every other feed that you have as well. So, uh, you, I would, I would, I would caution about certainly feeding 100% corn silage, but then you have to figure out what percentage you would use. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think our main takeaway from this webinar is definitely to make sure that you're testing that corn silage if you are going to use it. So with that, I just have a couple more things to let everybody know before we let you go here. One is how to get more science-based production advice through the BCRC as well as Ag Canada. So you can join both of our free email lists there. If you have a Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube account, you can connect with us there as well. Um, this is our last webinar of the season, so we will resume again in fall. As long as you are subscribed to our BCRC um, newsletter so if you go to our website beefresearch.ca and hit subscribe or you will be um we'll send out an email to notify you when the next webinars get started so shortly as soon as this webinar ends you're going to be asked to complete a short survey that asks about tonight's session and what you're most interested in for future webinar topics this is really important especially right now because i am planning for next year we do need your feedback to do the best we can to deliver information that's both useful and meaningful to you and helps you make decisions on your operation. So please please fill out that survey for me and don't hesitate to contact me with questions, comments, or any suggestions you have at any time. As I mentioned, you're going to be receiving an email from me in a couple of days with a link to watch the recording as well as links to some additional information on corn grazing. So that's it. I want to thank all of you at home for bearing with us through technical difficulties today and for joining us tonight. And on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank Karen and Vern for volunteering your time and expertise tonight. Good night and thank you very much.